I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, my name is Father Matthew Kozlowski. I'm one of the priest associates here at All Saints. Still getting to know some of you, and it's my joy and honor to be with you all this morning. Father Ed sends his greetings. He is actually at one of our sister parishes, uh, St. Francis in Potomac, Maryland, giving a very important stewardship sermon for that community, which is a blessing for both him and for them. But he sends his well wishes to all of us. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. I've been a priest for seven years, given many sermons, but I have rarely, if ever, preached directly on the topic of hell. This may say something about me, or perhaps about the church as a whole, or even our contemporary culture, but hell is not a topic we like to address. It doesn't get a lot of requests. <laughs> But then I was assigned this gospel passage to preach on based on the lectionary calendar. And as I was thinking about it, something else happened. About a week ago, one of my young daughters asked me, as they were getting ready for bed, Dad, what is hell? And how do people go there? The joys of being a parent. Fortunately, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I dug back into my brain for a definition of hell that I had picked up somewhere along the line, and I said to them, well, hell is a very lonely place. People go there because they don't want to be with God. So while this might not be the sermon you expected on a beautiful, gorgeous fall day in Chevy Chase, it is worth reflecting on this reality that Jesus puts before us, this reality of hell as a lonely place, and I promise there will be plenty of good news in this sermon. But the fact is that Jesus speaks of heaven and hell in the Gospels all the time, as much as any other topic. Regarding hell, he uses primarily two images, fire that never goes out and darkness that never grows light. The striking point about both of these images is the eternal, everlasting quality, perhaps even more important than the images themselves. Fire that never goes out, darkness that never grows light. It's almost impossible to conceive. C.S. Lewis, in his famous book, The Great Divorce, described hell as a dim, sprawling town, perpetually raining, filled with empty streets and dingy houses. In Lewis's imaginative version, hell is a place that stays dark and cold and wet in a perpetual dismal moment that never ends. It is this eternal futility, eternal frustration that Jesus is getting at when he says that hell is unquenchable. In other words, there is no satisfaction. This actually makes sense, because God is the source of our satisfaction. He fulfills the desires of our hearts. And hence, as I explained to my daughters, hell is a place that is very lonely, precisely because it is as far away from God as one could ever get. And what I might have added is that hell is a place where you can never be truly happy and never fulfilled. There's an old commercial for milk, of all things. This goes back a number of years, but in the commercial, uh, a man dies and suddenly finds himself in a beautiful white space with flowers and soft music playing. He sees a plate of giant chocolate chip cookies, picks one up, and takes a big bite. Mmm, he exclaims, this must be heaven. He walks over to a refrigerator, opens it up, and is thrilled to find it filled with cartons and cartons of milk. Yes, he says. He picks up a carton, but finds it empty. He shakes another, also empty, 
tearing through the refrigerator with no milk to be had, he looks up with a startled expression on his face and says, wait a minute, where am I? <laughs> Do you remember this one? The screen changes and two words appear, got milk, question mark. This was the beginning of that ad campaign. <laughs> now, it's a funny commercial. But theologically speaking, in terms of a vision of hell, it is somewhat right on target. Eternal frustration, no satisfaction, emptiness. The great theologians of the Christian tradition would have agreed. These are definitions that give us a proper understanding of hell. So what's the good news? I said there was going to be good news in this sermon. What's the good news? Well, indeed, the Bible is filled with us. The fact is that there is no reason for anyone ever to dwell in hell. Romans 10, 13, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 5, 24, truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Eternal life with God, what we call heaven, is promised to every person, any person who desires it through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, it means coming to the end of ourselves, as Father Ed likes to say. But the reward is eternal joy. What will heaven be like? Well, no one really knows. But my daughters did ask me. So I said, well, there's a lot of singing. And Jesus is in the middle. And we'll all be singing to Jesus, filled with joy, never growing tired. Do you remember the end of the hymn, Amazing Grace? We've no less days to sing his praise than when we'd first begun. Now all this brings up a potential problem, because what's the summary here? Hell is bad, heaven is good, so have faith in Jesus so you go to heaven and not hell? Is Christianity just about getting to heaven and avoiding hell? Is the whole religion simply a get out of hell free part? In a word, no. And that is why this gospel reading is so important. Let's take a look at it together right now, what Jesus says to us in the Gospel of Mark. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. What is going on here? Well, if you step back and look at the big picture, Jesus, in a brilliant rhetorical teaching, is integrating, linking the afterlife with our actions and our attitudes in this life. Let me say that again. Jesus is integrating, linking the afterlife with our actions and attitudes in this life. It doesn't really mean cut your hand off or your foot off or pluck your eye out. We know that. But what it does mean is for each one of us to look at the reality of our lives and to ask ourselves what perhaps needs to be cut out. To look at our thoughts, to look at your actions, your thoughts, your desires. What needs to go? What doesn't belong anymore? What doesn't fit anymore as a follower of Jesus? Like a puzzle piece that seemed right at first, but upon closer examination does not match at all. What doesn't fit with Christian life? could be as serious as an addiction, or as simple as how we drive or talk to people on the phone. And don't get me wrong, when it comes to addiction, that is a very serious topic that involves treatment in often cases, 
and I know people who have died from addiction. But I also know people who through treatment and the power of God have come through addiction and are now living lives of freedom and wholeness with that part of their life long gone. Jesus says this is important because what we do in life has eternal consequences. As it turns out, through our actions and our attitudes, we either draw closer to God or we push God further away. Not that we can ever earn heaven. That's not true. We know that. You can't behave your way into heaven. You can't earn grace. That's why it's grace. And at the same time, there is mistakes and there is loving forgiveness from God through Jesus. Indeed, Jesus Christ has paid the price and God forgives sinners. Thanks be to God. And all at the same time, the Bible, over and over again, urges us to draw closer to God. For as we draw closer to God, we prepare ourselves for heaven. Just as if we push God further away, we prepare ourselves for hell. So I know it's not Lent coming up when we usually talk about giving something up. But today, by virtue of the lectionary calendar, which has presented us with this gospel reading today, perhaps Jesus is asking each one of us what part of our life we might be ready to give up. What's weighing us down? What's getting in the way of our walk with God? I'd like to share with you a story about my father who died some time ago. But this is a story of when he was a young man, uh, recently married, and just starting off his career and working hard. He developed some really serious and severe back pain that bothered him every day. The doctor said it was either sciatica or a bulging disc. It was very painful for him. Well, one night, my father had a dream. He was in a basement or a garage filled with boxes of stuff, clothes and tools and books. And as he looked closer, he realized that all the stuff was actually his father's belongings, my grandfather. Well, the dream was actually true because his father had died when my dad was in college, and all of his stuff was indeed still at the family home in a basement in Indiana. The next day, my mother said to my father, John, I have this strange sense that you're supposed to go to Indiana. He said, that's interesting. Let me tell you about my dream. Well, sure enough, he took some time off, got in the car, and drove from Boston out toward Chicago, out to the family home in Indiana, stayed with his family, and indeed went down and spent the better part of a week in the basement and the garage going through all of his father's old things. Kept a few items, gave away a lot, and threw away a ton. And in essence, said goodbye to his dad. Drove back to Boston, got out of the car, and noticed something immediately. His back pain was completely gone. Went to bed that night pain-free. It never bothered him again. Now please understand the story as a sort of analogy. An analogy for how Jesus asks you and asks me, what needs to be cleaned out? It might be physical stuff, but more likely it's Emotional or attitudinal or having to do with our actions could be anger or resentment that we've been holding on for much too long. The joy of it is that we don't have to focus on the thing being given up, but rather on the feeling of being free. Like in the story, don't focus on the cardboard boxes in the garage, focus on the release and the relief in the end. In my case, if I can speak personally, in preparing for the sermon, I decided to cancel the Sirius XM radio subscription in my car, which I listened to a lot. But it wasn't bringing me joy anymore. And if I'm honest, the sports channel and the comedy channel that I mostly listened to were not drawing me any closer to God. If I'm really honest, they were probably drawing me away from God. You know what, I don't miss it. For those of you who are gardeners, there's another analogy here about pruning. Pruning is to cut off a dead branch or a wayward branch. Well, what I recently learned scientifically is that when a piece of a plant is cut off, the plant does not experience a net loss. 
because the plant takes the energy from that old branch and simply moves it to another part of the plant. The wasted energy is redirected to a new sprout, a new root, a new flower. In the same way, when we cut something out of our lives, when we prune it, something new will grow, or there will be more energy to nurture something else. Focus on that. A few cautions about all this business. Taking something out of our lives is not done by willpower. It's done by God power. Another caution, don't delay. Mother Teresa once said, yesterday is gone and tomorrow has not come and I have only today. She went on to say, we fear the future because we are wasting the today. And finally, know that we are all on a journey, a process. Some changes come quickly, others may be more gradual. <clears throat> But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The Lord is patient with you. Going back to the gospel passage that Jesus speaks to us today, is Jesus talking about this life? Or is he talking about the life to come? The answer is yes. Yes to both. He says to cut out those things that keep us from God in this life so that we can prepare to be with God in the next life. And it's not about earning it. We don't earn heaven. We don't behave our way into heaven. Grace is still grace. But Jesus says that God loves us, wants to be with us in this life and beyond. If we choose Jesus, we know in faith that forgiveness and new life is ever-present and that we will never be separated from God. Anything that we cut out will pale in comparison to that which we gain, both in this life and in the eternal joy that God has prepared for each one of us.